It's been a couple of weeks since the first episode of the second season and I'm back with another. Next episode should flow sooner rather than later, hopefully within a week or so. For now though, let's see what games I've found for today. Quatris 2 Plus is a Tetris variant and a sequel to Ariel Quatris, with no numbers, pluses or any other symbols in its name. It was originally released as Shirer and as such it offered 3 out of just under 20 levels available in the full version for free. Some might say it's very little content, but I think that's more than enough to learn if the game is worth your time and money. Spoiler, it really is. Anyway, gameplay-wise it uses near identical concept to Tetris, but adding quite a few new block shapes to the mix that add variety to the challenge. It also features differently sized and shaped playfield, fun. You obviously also die when the screen fills up, so if you ever played the original, you'll feel here right at home. I remember having a standalone handheld Tetris clone portable game back in the day and spending hundreds of hours on that bad boy, to the point that all the markings on the buttons wore off. Quatris 2 Plus is as addictive and also offers three kinds of bombs, Wipe, Match and Super Bomb, which all work a bit differently and help a lot in those near-death situations. There are also challenges in Quatris, yes, you heard that right, challenges, so every once in a while when you do particularly well, the game will ask you to complete a little extra task. And these are quite various, but math quizzes with simple equations to solve or memorization games are the most prominent of the included. They are neither too long nor challenging, so they don't get in the way of playing, and are a nice palette cleaner between all the Tetro Mines falling bonanza. Quatris 2 Plus is one of the most fun versions of Tetris that I played, and one that definitely deserves a modern remake and a permanent spot in services like Game Pass for instance, as it's a great title to play for a little while between other larger and more time consuming games. Queen was a cult British rock band that's responsible for many of the biggest hits of the 20th century. Their music was also remixed and used as a soundtrack for Queen DI, the game that we'll talk about now. It's an action-adventure game, very similar in its design, but not the theme, to Resident Evil titles. Meaning that the environments are in large part pre-rendered with some sparse 3D objects and all the characters are 3D and overlaid on top of that. Oh, and the camera is obviously fixed and swapping its position between the scenes, often erratically when you're at the point where two scenes switch. It was never a design that I would enjoy in games, as it was easy for me to get confused when it jumped between different points of the same room. The setting of Queen is rather dark, gloomy and depressing, it's a dystopian future where the world is ruled by the all-seeing machine called the Eye, which has eradicated anything and everything promoting creative expression. The world is bland, sad and submissive to the evil Eye. You play as Agent Dabrock, an operative cooperating with the Eye, an enemy to the populace, a traitor. But in the course of your duties, you accidentally rediscover a cache of old rock music and are promptly detected and sentenced to death in the so-called Arena, a live TV show where contestants battle former Arena champions called the Watchers. A cruel irony if you ask me. Anyway, doesn't this plot remind you of something? It serves very strong The Running Man vibes for me, an old underrated sci-fi flick with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Whatever. This is where the game starts, and from this point onward you take upon yourself to escape the arena and destroy the eye, as you finally saw it for what it really was. Interestingly enough, many elements present in the game were later on adapted into the musical We Will Rock You, so if you've seen it, you should recognize some story bits here and there. I've never had a chance to see We Will Rock You, or any other musical for that matter, so don't take my word for it. It's a curiosity I found about the game online. Gameplay features a lot of exploration and combat, hand-to-hand -hand and melee, so if you like that in those games with claustrophobically small room and corridor design, you'll enjoy it here too. Queen is not a bad game. It just came a little late, as it was way too long in development, so upon its release not only it looked a little dated, but also did not play as good as some other competitive titles did. Dusk of the Gods is an isometric view, non-linear action role-playing in an open world taking place shortly before Ragnarok, an epic battle at the end of the world between the god and giants in the Norse mythology. The sage Mimer predicted the future of the gods' realm. He proclaimed that Hela will raise army of the dead, that Loki, god of mischief, will lead against Odin. Thor, Heimdall and Freya will all fall pierced by the horn of Loki, and the fire giant sword will cover the Asgard in flames. The future seems inevitable, but is it? To counter the Grim Vision and prevent the Ragnarok, Odin, father of all gods, summons you, a fallen hero to change the tides of the future. And he couldn't have picked better. I mean, you've saved the world at least a dozen times since we've started with the series, a universe once or twice, and easily 5-6 civilizations from extinction. If I remember correctly, you once even saved a small and remote melee island from hands of the evil pirate Lechak 2. No small feat I must add. 
that's a story for another day though. Anyway, you're taking a role of a resurrected warrior sent out by Odin to change the destiny of the gods to help them avoid the fall in the coming war. Unlike grand majority of titles of the time, Dusk of the Gods offers a full day-night cycle, non-linear gameplay and huge fully open world that you can explore to your heart's content in any order and way you see fit. As you travel, meet many characters and combat different enemies, you get progressively stronger and acquire newer, better weapons and armor. Dusk of the Gods is an unusual for the time roleplaying that's sadly plagued by rather simple and blunt combat system, which is the greatest of sins in games that center their entire gameplay mechanics on action combat. If it doesn't bother you too much though, the setting and story is pretty interesting and the game is worth experiencing. If not for anything else, then at least to see if you'd like it. My most favorite genre of games are turn-based role-playings, then strategies, also turn-based obviously, then business slash economy simulations and management games. Then there's the rest in no order in particular between them. Dynatech is one of the first few. So from the get-go, Dynatech is a title in a much better starting position than any other random one could be as it's a business simulation through and through and I love this. It has one downside though. English version is nigh impossible to find and the German one because of the complexities of gameplay is difficult to comprehend by those who don't speak the language. And I don't, so... Anyway, the story background to the gameplay states that in the future the natural resources of Earth are either depleted or on the verge of being so. And to combat the starvation and fall of humans, a giant company called Dynatech is created to secure the growing demands of Earth. It helps those willing to discover, develop and exploit distant worlds do just that, by supplying them with anything that's necessary, be it in terms of technology, hardware or know-how. You're one such someone who realizes the potential for huge profits and wants to try to get a piece of the potentially limitless in terms of gains pie. So you can and will buy facilities and spaceships from Dynatech, you will find, extract and develop products and machines from raw materials and also farm food too. But most importantly, you'll keep an eye on Earth's ever-changing supply and demand economy, adjusting your production output and sales to maximize the profits. And while it may not look like it at first glance, the underlying economic models of Dynatech are surprisingly complex for a game from 1991, which if utilized properly, guarantee a long-lasting and enjoyable trading experience and potential in-game millions to be made. Unfortunately, however, Dynatech is not the easiest of games and having access to the game manual that explains many of its concepts in detail is recommended. Not necessary if you're willing to power through everything by trial and error and many failed attempts, but having it makes the first few games considerably less frustrating. Interestingly enough, while there was a huge potential to add some side activities to the gameplay like sabotage between the competing companies, space piracy, industrial espionage and such, the devs omitted this entirely and focused on polishing the business side of things. It makes the game feel well thought out, but also lacking variety a little. Despite what may be shown in the footage, as it's not the easiest to get a good one for the game, Eco Phantoms is a sorta of hybrid between exploration, action-based combat, puzzle solving and arcade game. It features a very unique and unusual interface and design, and looks like something that I should love. But before we get any further, let me quickly tell you what it's all about. You, as a protagonist that you usually are when playing games or watching videos on this channel, are coming back from a six years long mission in space. You're loaded with money and keen to get back home to spend it, and have a little R&R in luxury that you crave for the last few years. It's not meant to be, however, as when you arrive, Earth is unlike the blue ball that you've left behind. It's dark, grey and a huge alien ship hovers above it menacingly. Worst of all, with use of alien installations, it's sucking, no, draining the planet dry of its natural resources. Yep, the aliens, titular eco-phantoms are not a friendly bunch whatsoever. So, even though all you want to do is sleep for the next two days to recover and then spend few weeks doing literally nothing on a poolside somewhere drink in hand, it's not in the cards for you, and you'll have to once more save the world. So, you steal one of the eco zeppelin crafts, get down to Earth and we'll try to reverse the process before it's too late. Sounds cool, right? Yeah, I thought so too. The game feels fiddly most of the time, the concepts that it portrays seems to be tied to each other via invisible strings that feel as if they should not be together under the same roof at all. So, you'll traverse some kind of an alien tunnels on Earth in step-by-step -step 3D dungeoning a la Eye of the Beholder, you'll shoot at frantically moving enemy ships, you'll crack some codes on the scout ships, you'll enter various buildings to find even more codes for the buildings that you'll find later, and blast enemy spheres or whatever they are with a robot that you'll control. And so on and so on and so on until you finally move to the next stage. You'll also try to destroy alien buildings by setting off explosives and then shooting at their outer worlds looking for a weak spot for some reason, it's odd to say the least. 
If I could only comprehend how really these and few other sequences connect together so that I could have a clear picture why it makes sense, I would find it to be a better game. As it is, it feels like a lot of random busy work just to give you something to do, and I don't particularly enjoy it. Perhaps you will or did, and if that's the case, let me know why in the comments below. Future Dimension is a really cool and undeservedly so obscure title. It's a shoot em up featuring horizontal, vertical and even faux 3D behind the ship levels in its gameplay loop, which in turn makes a very varied and fun gameplay. But while the styles change quite often, catering for fans of different kinds of shooters, there's something missing in Future Dimension overall. I mean, don't get me wrong, I like it, but it feels as if it was made by AI. That just sampled all the other shooters on the market, condensed them into a single executable file, including all types of viewpoints, obligatory four different weapons that are upgradable by picking up green symbols, added other add-ons like homing rockets and helpful ship satellites, and bombs for a good measure, all to come up with a very unique experience that somehow still felt a bit generic anyway. Once again, I like it. But I was never a true shoot em up aficionado, and other than Warblade, with most I'm fine with completing them once or twice and therefore getting about them forever. Future Dimension kept me interested with its variety. It features six large levels, 3D pre rendered cutscenes and minigames inspired by classics such as Pac-Man or Galaga between them. Sounds and graphics are all pretty good, definitely spot on what you'd expect from the genre in 1996 and fit nicely around the bullet hell loop of the gameplay. Should you play Future Dimension today? Definitely, it's a fun and good game. It may not be the genre defining one, but you're not gonna get bored playing it. Batman can guarantee it. I'm Batman! See, I told you. Now, go grab it and play it. Gender Wars is a futuristic sci-fi squad-based shooter bearing certain similarities to Syndicate, mainly in how it plays and an isometric top-down view, cause its story couldn't be more far off to that of Syndicate. Not Wars, mind you, just entirely different. In the far off future, the planet is decimated by a number of violent and polluting civil wars and the remaining population is forced to move into vast underground cities, kinda like vaults in Fallout. Numerous stretching long years conflicts and general disagreements between the genders on how worlds should look and rebuild resulted in populations split into two opposing factions, male and female. And the disputes that they had with each other soon turned into full-fledged titular gender wars. This is where the game starts. You can play as either male or female styled and have to lead it to ultimate victory, which given how we reproduce in real life could also be considered an ultimate loss. The victory is achieved by leading a small group of up to 4 soldiers through a series of increasingly more demanding missions. There are 14 for each side for a total of 28 and they all have different primary and secondary objectives. The first need to be completed for the mission to be successful, second only raise your score upon its completion. Soldiers who survive missions intact with all their organs and limbs still where they're supposed to be gain experience and race through the ranks, with the squad leader being the highest of honors. And the squad leader needs to be present during each mission, regardless how many soldiers participate in it. Missions cannot be run without them. And when the last squad leader dies, the game is lost. Gender Wars, for me at least, was much better game than Syndicate. I was obsessed with it. Not very good at it, but I played it maniacally. Sadly, my copy at the time was of questionable legality, so I missed all the cutscenes and introduction, so I played it as a faster, more entertaining, more varied and better looking Syndicate. And not as what it was, as I only had a vague knowledge of its story. Gender Wars has some bugs, sure, no doubt about that, especially with how soldiers use the lifts or don't use them to be precise, standing atop or bottom like NPCs in most MMOs, firmly glued to singular spot, waiting for you to come back for them. And even if they eventually figure them out themselves, they often require a couple of attempts before they mount the lift correctly. But all those bugs are superficial only and the game itself is just great and a definition of a hidden gem. So if you enjoyed Syndicate at all, give Gender Wars a chance, it may be up your alley. The Eye of the Typhoon may be the most obscure game in this whole video as it never had an official western release and only ever came out in South Korea. It's a 2D one-on-one -on -one versus fighter with 12 playable characters and 2 in-game bosses. The characters are Hoya, who's the main hero of the game's storyline, Roy, rugged western adventurer, Sari, who's Kunochi, so a female ninja, Cho Hong, a female warrior, Wang Chang, Chinese mahjong player, Mui, a mysterious jungle warrior, Nelson, a gentleman fighting with a whip, Tlaloc, Aztec warrior, Dalma, old tiny fighter using a magical stick, Musai Taro, who's a ninja, Natasha, a huge Russian female fighter, Jarkil, a masked dancer, and Powell is a sub-boss, with Mahesvara being a final opponent of the game with two separate forms, 
one male and one female. Each of the playable fighters have basic punches and kicks and their own unique special attacks. It's a pretty standard fare for the genre really, but that's not bad, it's just not surprising in any way. What is unusual though, at least for fighting games on PC, is that it uses similar zooming effect to that in Art of Fighting on Neo Geo and in the arcades. So it zooms in and out the camera depending on how close the opposing characters are from each other. Interestingly enough, there's also a taunt in the game, but there's no in-game mechanics attached to it. Probably an oversight in development and it has no use other than the aesthetic and to leave you open for attacks. So it's best to ignore it altogether. The Eye of the Typhoon can be played in single player, 1v1 or 2v2 modes and it's pretty fun. It's not good enough to challenge juggernauts of the genre like Street Fighter 2 Turbo or Mortal Kombat, but it's plenty fun to stand on its own legs. Story-wise, many many years ago during the times of one of the Elden Eastern dynasties, a martial art known as the Eye of the Typhoon was very popular. As time went by, however, it was gradually less and less practiced and eventually forgotten, to the point of being a myth among martial artists training other popular styles years later. As Western countries started practicing various fighting styles and perfecting them, the long-forgotten style resurfaced somehow and everyone jumped on the train to learn it. Hence the tournament was born, to test the knowledge of the best fighters from around the world in it. The plot, as you see, is super silly, but as in most other games in the genre, it's also unimportant in the scope of what the game's about. And if you're a fan of fighters, this one's definitely worth tracking down and playing. For a long time I was under the impression that Hired Guns was originally developed for Amiga and then ported to PC. It's obviously incorrect as they were made concurrently. Is that important in any way here? Not really, I just thought I'd let you know cause chances are you might have thought the same. Anyway, Hired Guns is a light role playing slash dungeon crawling game set in the dark and grim future of 2712 where you're in control of 4 mercenaries out of pool of available 12. All of them have their own viewpoints and can either be commanded by you or by up to 4 different players all at once on a single system, which I don't have to tell you is an ideal situation and most fun you can squeeze out of this game, playing it with friends, going through the dungeons and killing buddies. I said light initially and I meant that the role playing aspects are rather simplified and focused towards more action packed gameplay. I didn't mean that hired guns is easy, there's plenty of challenge and fun action in it that most would no doubt enjoy its difficulty curve. Your main mission is to destroy all illegal bioengineered creatures on the aptly named planet Graveyard. You can do so by finding and using four fusion power core rings in the so called field core generators, which would cause a controlled thermonuclear explosion. Hired Guns is played in full 3D similar to Eye of the Beholder games and enemies have complete freedom of movement, meaning that if they want to, they can chase your team throughout the entire game, even changing floor levels as you do. Admittedly, I haven't played Hired Guns as much as I should and that's on me, but what I saw and read in reviews clearly confirms its cult classic status among the very few that had a chance to experience it in full. It's worth pointing out that the levels are brilliantly designed and the game offers a variety of weapons and other useful items like psionic amplifiers, repair kits, medical packs to name a few, all to suit everyone's gameplay styles in the demanding combat encounters. While Hired Guns is not an easy game, it's a good first title for those who want to have a taste of action roleplaying without needing to memorize hundreds of spells or min-maxing their builds to even be viable. And it's definitely worth playing for all fans of dungeon crawling RPGs. Inner Worlds is a shareware game, divided into three episodes as these tend to be, and first was available for free. Also, exactly how shareware games often used to be distributed. In any case, it's a side-scrolling action platformer and one of the most criminally overlooked DOS titles of the mid-90s. I mean, sure, most of us moved to Windows by 1996 when it released, but there were still really fun games dropping for DOS then, and overlooking one as fun as Inner Worlds was definitely a mistake. One that I'm also guilty of. Anyway, you play as a young skimp-dressed woman, Nikita, and she happens to be a werewolf. I would say like in Twilight, but I've never read books nor saw the movies, so I'm not sure if there were any werewolves along with the vampires. But I do have a feeling that they might have been so... Maybe like Twilight, but not necessarily... Oh, I know, like an American werewolf in London, short of the London itself, with woman rather than a man being said creature and less horror -y. So when I think of it, it's entirely different, actually. Oh well. You can jump, climb, crawl, hang on to things that allow hanging from and change into wall form whenever squeezing through shorter passages or more oomph to your unarmed attack is necessary. It's worth mentioning that wall form also has a frenzy attack that literally tears through enemies. As you go through the game you'll find various pickups and these can range from different potions refilling health or mana for instance as well as necklaces that upgrade your health, mana or attack permanently. 
Weapons such as swords and bows among others can be picked up and used too, and you can even upgrade them with special scrolls that will give them unique abilities. Every episode is composed out of 9 levels and every third level you get to fight a unique boss. They usually require a bit of different approach and are generally speaking fun to fight against, but they're nothing new and if you fought end level bosses in other games, you'll know how to tackle these too. The regular enemies are plenty and quite varied and represent different animals associated with horror and macabre, like spiders, centipedes and bats, as much as really weird ones like green stretchy armed beasts and even alien-like creatures. First episode sees Nikita traveling towards the castle of Drofanarp, oddly named place indeed, in search for Gralo even weirder named evil creation of a misguided genius that is supposedly residing in it. In second episode, she learns that Gralop was but one of a duo of monstrosities plaguing the land. And in third, she travels to the mountains where in a volcano the secret of Drafnar lies. I know, I know, these names are crazy, but think of me. I'm not a native speaker and I have to tongue twist my way around these terrible letter jumbles. Inner World's sound and music design are really well fitting, adding a lot to the eerie mood and grim atmosphere. And the graphics are nicely drawn and smoothly animated, though honestly nothing to write home about in 1996. Overall, it's a fun action game that's worth completing even today. How did you enjoy today's 10? I tried covering various genres so that everyone could find something for themselves between them. This was and is a bottomless well of little known games and most of them are interesting for a variety of reasons. Good or bad, they all had something worth remembering for. Hence, why we're here. If you liked the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. If you didn't, well, then there's thumbs down there too. But I suppose you wouldn't have persevered up to this point if you really didn't. Around 60% of you are not subscribed and there's currently no way of knowing if YouTube will decide to recommend you the next episode or not. Other than subscribing and hitting that bell, that is. And when you hit that bell, whenever the new video is out, YouTube will actually send you a small and friendly notification about it, so you wouldn't miss it. If you'd like to support the channel, Patreon and YouTube memberships are a great way of doing so. They will help me release better content and also they get first dips on all new videos before they're publicly accessible on YouTube. If you can't or don't want to do that though, likes and subscribes are great too. I would like to take a moment here and thank all the YouTube creators from whose videos short bits were taken to serve as a background to my commentary. They're amazing and stars among the retro community. You will find names of their channels at the top of the screen when their footage is running and also in the video description below. For me though, this is all, so have a good one and I'll see you next time. Peace.